welcome and thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Technado. I'm Sophie Goodwin, and you might have noticed by the background around me, if you're familiar with Technado, that we are no longer at home. We're not in Gainesville anymore. We are on location right now at the Kennedy Space Center, and I'm not alone. Of course, I've got Mr. Daniel Lowry, Daniel Lowry with me to my left. Look at that. I'm already so excited about the con Absolutely. that I'm just losing my mind. Daniel, yeah. you looking forward to Hackspace Con? I, I am. I came last year, which, uh, first year. A lot of fun, a lot of great talks, a lot of great speakers. And it seems to be ramping up to be twice as good from last year. So I'm I'm kind of excited about this. Well, see, I wouldn't know because yeah. I, I did not come last year. But if it's going to be twice as exciting, man, I, I really don't know what to tell you about that. <laughs> so, yes, we are here at Hackspace Con. Uh, we're going to be, I believe, on Friday live streaming some of that. So be sure to check out the channel for that on Friday. It'll be the day after this episode is released. But for now, we've got all the latest in technology and security news for you. I say all the latest. I should probably do a disclaimer. There's yeah. no way we could cover everything. No. Welcome to hour we 12 right. of Technado. Exactly. We try to rapid fire. <laughs> we, we try to cover what we think is fun uh, and yeah. relevant to cover. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and jump in. If you're new here, rapid fire. We're going to go through these articles pretty quickly. Give some some quick little hot takes or at least some lukewarm takes. We'll take a quick break and then when we come back, we'll have a deep dive later in the show. Daniel, you ready? I wanted to do cold takes. Is that okay? Cold takes? Yeah, yeah sure. Freezing cold yes. takes. Ice. Brought to you by Technado. Arctic. Yes. Arctic takes. We actually will have a an icy segment or an icy uh, article later on. But to, to go around. with the theme, we are one of the moons of Jupiter. Yes. So that's how icy we are. <laughs> yes. Wow. Wow. That's that's a that's nerdy a deep space cut joke. right there. Right? That's yeah, pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty good. Deep space I, cut, if you will. I like it. Well, this I first. You, I see what you did there. It's deep space. You. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's you. funny because like cyberspace, space con. You know, I feel like deep there's a connection space. they could make there, but. Yeah. Uh -huh. What do I know? Loose, I'm not the wordplay expert. <laughs> we'll go ahead and jump into these articles here. Uh, this first one, if you're a if you're a Bing fan, if you're a Bing enjoyer, you might want to listen up. This one comes to us from Malwarebytes. Bing ad for NordVPN leads to, I prefer to pronounce this as Sectoprat, but it is Sectoprat. Uh, so there's a download file called NordVPNSetup.exe, and it is digitally signed, so it looks official, but I promise you it's not. It does look official. And I'm, I'm a little disappointed you didn't do this as Tommy from... Because <laughs> Bing, From, oh. Bing, what are you still doing, right? You know. <laughs> what are you still doing uh, here? Because I know how much you love Goodfellas. Yeah, thought I told you to go download that malware. That's right. What are you yes. still doing? Are you supposed to get the malware, right? <laughs> but here you go, right, the old Bing. That's right. So NordVPN, one of the more uh, popular VPNs that are out there, and well, I guess for good reason, right? If you're into VPN stuff, it can definitely help you do what you're looking to do VPN-wise, maybe add a little layer of security, or what we all know what you're actually doing is watching Netflix in other countries so that sure. you don't get hit with a stupid, hey, you're not from around here kind of business, so you can't have <laughs> access to that content. But guess what? That makes it a prime target for people to go, what if I, hmm, let me try, digga, 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 and then now we've got ourselves uh, a way to use an advertisement to kind of funnel people into an area that they shouldn't be going to, but looks legit. This is a common practice of the old Malware people out there that love to engage in these activities. Yeah. And so, it, no, go ahead. I was yeah. just gonna say, make it make it look like the real thing yeah. to fool you, yeah. so that when you and, and what's kind of interesting is that they used an advertisement. I would have never fallen from this, and not because I don't like NordVPN or other <laughs> things like that, because I scroll past all the sponsored ad stuff in all my search results, regardless if it's Bing or Google or whatever, yeah. because I hate the fact that you're trying to advertise to me. Yeah, because I'm weird. Out of spite. Yes, I'm not going to click. Literally on those. out of spite. Will I will refuse to go. If you're That's trying right. to advertise, but you're right. It, it does have, as in addition to the malware payload, it has an installer for NordVPN in it. So when you download, you know, it gives you the illusion that you are installing a real life file. Uh, and if we look here, they show kind of some of what's included in the file. Um, the payload is injected into msbuild.exe, next to the malware author's command and control server. Ooh boy, command and control. That's uh, yeah. th that's kind of a buzzword. Yeah, command and control is kind of a big deal, right? Yeah. They they need that. So once they make uh, they infiltrate your system, now whenever they need it or want it, they're going to need to be able to control it from, uh, you know, a remote area. So command and control is always a thing you got to look out for. That's going to be one of your IOCs if you're looking into stopping this, cleaning up the the thing, or if you're analyzing this partic particular malware. Yeah. You'll want to grab those uh, pieces of information to put them available or, or, or use them in your, your defensive systems to say, hey, we're going to make a DNS sinkhole to, you know, nothing where. So if someone tries to go to this, it actually goes nowhere. Right. Or we're just going to block all traffic to and from. So ingress and egress filtering, make all that happen using those um, those C2 communication channels. Now, you also have to worry about whether or not it's over something like HTTP, 
HTTP, HTTPS, or DNS, or something other, some other normal services. That's typically how things go. So you just got to be on the lookout for that stuff as well. And always double check your URLs because in this case they used a lovely little method called typo squatting. Yeah, they did. Isn't Damn, that, that typo squatting continues to be kind of a, a pain in the arse, as it were. Right. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Because you got to look. You got to be really kind of man. I, I wonder if there's an extension or something you can install into your browser that will go, hey, I see you're trying to go to Microsoft, but this is Microsoft. <laughs> I feel like that's not where you were going. <laughs> Microsoft. Therefore, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's let's not go there. <laughs> yeah, let's not. They, they do have some uh, indicators compromise listed Malwarebytes has provided. Yeah. By the way, we are going to put the links for all these articles in the description of the video, so you can check those out if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening on your podcast platform, we recommend you come check out the YouTube channel so you can get to those articles and see all the lovely visuals that we have here. But yeah, moral of the story, look look out for that malvertising stuff. Yeah, just it is, skip the ads. Just skip the ads. <laughs> yeah, don't reward them with your clicks. No, They're, no. Yeah, I <laughs> thought you, thought you were gonna start start on a rant there for a no. second. Now this next one, uh, it it seems like oh, scary. Yeah. But I think, you know, there's some stuff that gets revealed later in the article that it's not as scary as we might think. So over 92,000 exposed D-Link NAS devices have a backdoor account, or NAS devices, NAS, rather. NAS, yeah. I almost uh, network, say NAS. Which is, yes, yeah, network attack storage, network right? Network attack storage, yep. So uh, 92,000 is a big number. Um, I don't want to bury the lead, though. These are <laughs> end-of-life devices. Yeah, no so clickbait here. No clickbait here. They're end-of-life, but still, you know, there's a decent chance people are still using them. Well, exactly. Depending on how old this device is, or these devices are that uh, have this this issues or these issues, there's two issues specifically. One is the fact that there's like a backdoor user into the devices that are they're baked into the firmware. So it has a username of what was it? Um, oh, something message bus. bus. Yeah, message bus. No password. Huh. So fun. And then you can parlay that to have authentication. Or you know, you're now you're kind of past the authentication. You can act as a user, and now you can find the system parameter and you can use that for command execution. So from there, it's, yay, oh, no, the, the walls are burning down. Again, D-Link, <laughs> as they say, what was kind of interesting about this, and I've actually run into this where I found a, uh, a flaw in the, the web admin portal okay. of, of, an, of a Belkin router. I had an old Belkin router. I was kind of fiddling around doing some hardware hacking and some, some firmware hacking, and I was like, huh, well, this is interesting. I can't, I, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm totally exposing the password to this thing. Unauthenticated. I found that, and I, I, you know, I contacted Belkin and let them know, and they were like, "Well, it's an end of life product, so it's out of scope." They didn't care. They said, "So what? Yeah. No one's using this." I'm like, "Is no one using this?" I'm I, calling you. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure that it's not a widely used device anymore. But depending on when this thing was EOL'd, there might still be. How often have you changed your router lately? Right? I've probably had mine <laughs> no for comment. two and a half, three years. <laughs> yeah. Right. And if it end of lifed. Right as the time I got that as a device from my provider, yeah. or I bought it, I could easily still follow under the scope of this thing. And depending on how much you know leeway they give, I did see that that D-Link said that they still have firmware and security kind of advisories and support for some of their end of life uh, yeah. products. So you would definitely want to go there. But most people don't pay attention to this kind of thing. Yeah. So it still could be an issue. You still might be running this old end of life device, and now you're a part of a botnet. Yeah, I mean, Which is what we don't want to do. That's that's bad. <laughs> we want to avoid that, right? Yeah. So just saying. And just because a, a device or a you know uh, operating system, whatever has has been out of service and it's, it doesn't receive support anymore, doesn't mean people aren't still using it. There was that train station we talked about that was like running on Windows ninety three or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Like it was it was the the so, oldest. So there was no Windows ninety three. No, I don't know. You know, I'm tired, man. It's been a long day. Windows ninety five. <laughs> it has been. been. Windows eighty seven thousand. It. Uh, I remember so Windows ninety three. It was awesome. Long. It was the best in the Windows. Look. Distro ever, uh, they just got to bring it back. That's all I'm saying. We just we can't go one episode without clowning on me a little bit. I don't even think I was alive for that release of Windows. I, I feel like what you were 95. doing is conflating the year and the operating system. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it, I conflate a lot. Right, of you weren't around. When I was Windows. not around. I can't be expected to know. Moral of the story here: There's no patches for this, but that's because these devices are end of life. Doesn't mean you're not still using them. So maybe keep an eye on that. <laughs> You said there's no patches, and I, I immediately my brain went to Mario with Bowser singing, patches, 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 patches. <laughs> <laughs> like, I missed that, yeah, I missed that I level know. of the I game. I know how okay. my brain made that connection, but that's what happened. <laughs> Tons of fun. Oh, man. We should get a sponsorship from Nintendo. <laughs> right. How often we make references to that. We'll go ahead and jump into this next one. Uh, this is, this is going to be a fun one. 
If you are a Fortnite enjoyer, keep an eye out. Threat actors are delivering malware via YouTube video game cracks. And most of the games that were listed, uh, Fortnite was definitely a big one. But if we come down here, they've got uh, a whole screenshot here. For a while, this channel was posting, I believe, in Thai. And then suddenly made a random switch to English. And it's Fortnite, Roblox, uh, Valorant. I think there's a couple of Premiere Pro, which is kind of, that doesn't really fit the theme. It's right. Well, games. That, that's... um. That's an Adobe software, right? The Premiere. Right, yeah. Right. I just mean, they, I was like, game, 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 game. Adobe Premiere Pro, in case you'd like to. Yeah, well, obviously, editing. they're using the idea that, hey, would you like to crack this software? Right, exactly. Right? Come and get these cracks. Come and crack, you know, cheats for your games, cracks for your apps, and come and get this. So this is one of those those times where you're like, it's kind of like what we, so we talked about last week with Activision, if I'm not mistaken. Right. It was yes. Activision. People were buying cheats, mm -hmm. and that sh those cheats had been... I guess been taken over and, and infected with some form of malware, mm -hmm. and even the the cheat developer was like, "Oh, what is this? Oh no, that's yeah. that's not what I meant." But you're you're doing something that's kind of like under the table anyway. Yeah. And here we are, same kind of thing. So I, oh, I don't know what it is in the gaming community, but apparently they are a bunch of underhanded. I'll, I'll just stop. Anyway, there's yeah. a lot of people in the, in the gaming community that are looking to do things they probably shouldn't be doing. It's like, just have fun. Just have fun. Yeah, just have fun. Stop. Well, I think one it's of the things you. that... You're, you're them, aren't they? Aren't that's you? me? Yeah. yeah. I don't tell anybody. Yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not a serious gamer. I'm a casual gamer. Yeah, cash. You know, if you were like, hey, you, play, you play this game, you'd yeah. probably laugh at me with how little knowledge I have about it. But yeah. I said something last week or the week before about being like, I mean, if you're cheating at these games... And then because you download a bunch of cheats, then something happens. It's like, well, uh, you were, you're kind of, it's like if you try to rob a bank and then right. as a result, you like, like break you your wrist or right. something. You it's fell like, and you're like, I want a cop. Right. Yeah. It's like, this well, is completely. What yeah. do you think was going to happen? You know? Yeah. But in this case, uh, it says it's concerning because it targets younger users with games right. that are really popular amongst like young kids. So games like Fortnite, right? Not that well, you and, can't and enjoy. That's kind of smart of them. Yeah. Because kids don't have the you know the maturity oh, and the sure. wherewithal They're just gonna to be able to right. They're just like, yeah. what's the big deal? I just want to cheat for my game. I want to go into God mode and jump yeah. around and be able to fly and you know teleport and do all the things that you can do <laughs> with cheats in the game. So they just think that's what they're doing, but then they're infecting their systems, and then that infection probably leads to more infections within their own ecosystem oh, yeah. right at home. And now we're looking staring down the barrel of another botnet or. Whatever the case is. They even include detailed instructions in the comments about it. They, they have a, a screenshot of it here. You have problems <laughs> with downloading. Don't worry. You got you just got to disable your antivirus. Oh, yeah. Uh, try to use a different browser. Disable Windows Smart Screen Update. It's like, it, it just. So turn off all the right. security. But if you're a kid, you're not thinking about like, that. When I was 10, like, I wasn't yeah, thinking about that. I'm yeah. totally turning this off. I need this crack, yo. Right. <laughs> you mean I can get cheats for Toontown? All right, sign yeah, me up. Toontown. You know? Toontown's not one of the yeah. games. Otherwise, League of Legends. Mm, I might have fallen victim there. <laughs> oh, they'd have had you. Huh? <laughs> so if you're 10 and if you're, watching oh, this. If you're doing OSIN on, so on Sophie, <laughs> yeah. right? she's like giving it notes, away. Yeah. She's giving Toontown it away. rewritten. That's the way so to target your me. So password is Toontown 2024. Hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, this is another instance of, we got a lot of articles that have to do with, like, malware or secret, because, like, there was the the VPN, the NordVPN thing, where yeah. it was, like, Not secretly... tons of breaches this week, I don't think. I don't think right? so, no. No. So, breaches, malware... Breaches, 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 breaches. <laughs> That's even better, because it rhymes. Right. Oh, you're on a roll. <laughs> we'll, jump uh, in, we'll jump into this next one. I do love my one. job. <laughs> you really do. You really do. And that's good. You should enjoy it. Uh, this next one's a part of a segment that we have not seen on Technado for a hot minute. It's tinfoil hat. Landing was fake. Paul McCartney's been dead since 1966. Dogs can't see color. Five G causes syphilis. So I didn't realize that those uh, interviews that Weird Al does, yeah. like he, I didn't realize those were fake. Like uh, how he just, I saw like one clip of him. Like he's doing so one absurd with in a lot of times. And I didn't like, realize. I'm like, huh? Anyway, not the point. But he's in the little, he's yeah. in the little lower third. Yeah, yeah. This article comes to us from SC Media. Alleged Five Eyes data stolen from Acuity breach exposed. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna show my greenness a little bit here. Okay. Um, Daniel and I were talking about this the other day, and I was not super familiar with Five Eyes, but you kind of, you explained it in a way that made well, sense to me. I, I will tell you how I understand it. I could be wrong on this, but from what I understand, Five Eyes are the five countries that have, like, uh, a, a gentleman's agreement to, uh, you know, a handshake deal. So in the U.S., the United States government is not allowed to spy on U.S. citizens. It's illegal. It's against the law. That's good. Yeah, they ain't going to do it. You have to get you have to get a warrant before it's legal for you to be able to, and therefore you have to show just cause and have a judge go through it. There's sure. there's all sorts of stuff. There's hoops that you have to jump through if you want to wiretap or sniff down on any U.S. citizen. 
Great Britain, on the other hand, doesn't have those restrictions. I mean, it, other than it's illegal, and we would have to prosecute them if we discovered that they were doing it. But if we just go, hey, don't do that anymore. And you go, what's that you left that there? You, you dropped something. It's all this information about Sophie. That oh, <laughs> uh, I mean, that seems interesting <laughs> for us. Yeah. We should probably use that. So there's this agreement that while we can't do it legally, and neither can you, but only if we prosecute you would there be a problem. So you spy on our people for us. We'll spy on our, your people for you, mm. and we'll gather information that way. Okay. I could be way off. This is why this is in the tinfoil hat section, right? Is, yeah. This is how I understand this to work. If you're more in tune with this, please, in the comment section below, find okay, us, yeah. give us a comment. Let's yeah. know a little more detail about the old five eyes. I would, yeah. Any, any context in this, I would, I would love to hear. But, but who doesn't love a good conspiracy theory, who, Oh, right? yeah. I mean, this is just fun. Uh, we need to start bringing back Tim Foyle hat more often. We surely do. We, we really do. Segment. But, but I mean, this goes along with it, right? Right. And in this case, it was data allegedly stolen. Allegedly. 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 allegedly okay. uh, stolen from a breach of U.S. federal technology, a consulting firm called Acuity, and uh, this this group, Intel Broker, who uh, we've we've heard their name before. They're, I think in oh, yeah, another article yeah. we looked at that they yeah, we've seen oh that. they're a bunch of rascals, miscreants. I think is yeah. the word. That's Malfeasance. Sometimes. Malfeasance. That's one of my yes. favorite. Claimed that the exposed data trove also included sensitive information from members of the government and military. Fun. So fun. <laughs> so uh, so that's never good. But uh, what but is the government saying about this? It's a good question. Let's find out. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security has dismissed the leak to include made-up names and contact details to be used as test demos for vendors. That's interesting. What Do you think Do you think that's entirely true? So theory. Theory. If, if I know my government, and I feel like I do, this isn't untrue. It's just not the whole truth. Mm. Right? That's how it works, ladies and gentlemen. We give you some truth. I don't know. I like conspiracy theories, so I want this to be true. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's not your information. Yeah, I just love this You're fine stuff, with right? it. Yeah. yeah. Man, government's out to get you. Oh, run for the hills. Big, dig a big dump bunker and stick food <laughs> and toilet Fall paper in it. Yeah. Just hide down in That's there. That's what's up, man. Prepper time. <laughs> I have to go play Fallout after this. Uh, I'm going to be in the mood for it. But like I said, Intel Broker is not the first time we've heard them mentioned. Uh, yeah. They've claimed attacks against the L.A. International Airport, General Electric, among some other pretty big names. What's so the he said, she said going on here? He said, she said. By yeah. the seashore. Sean Connery over <laughs> yeah. there. He yeah. said, she he said, she said. Oh, My wife has a she shed. <laughs> Five eyes data breach. Do you have a she shed? I do not. I don't have enough <laughs> but you room know what to have okay. a she shed. <laughs> <laughs> a little apartment. You live in an apartment. Not, Turned her yeah. closet into a she shed. I was going to say, I'm, I'm in my 20s. You She's, think I own a home? Yeah. You think uh, I own property? Yeah. Uh-uh. No way. One day, hopefully. hopefully. We'll you will see. be a landowner. Give me about 60 years and I'll be there. <laughs> 60 years. So this, God forbid is, that that is the case. This is a this is a legend, once again, it yeah. does say in the in the article title. But a legend. Good to, good to know, especially if you do live in the U.S. And, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, it's just good to keep in mind. Now, this next one, it's not... Um, we try to keep a security focused here. This one's a, a little bit different, but because we're at Hackspace.com this week, we thought this made sense to, to include. After five months of debugging, NASA finally knows why Voyager 1 sends gibberish data, or gibberish, if you prefer. Gibberish? For a hard G, gibberish. Yeah. Is yeah. it GIF or GIF, right? I think it, I think it's GIF because graphic is the first G. Yeah. And so, I don't know. Anyway. But then there's giraffe. That's true, but it's not right. an acronym. It's not. Is GIF? Let yeah, us know. It is, yeah. is it GIF uh, or GIF? The 80-year-old debate. Yeah. Is, I haven't Speaking heard of, of 80-year-old debates. <laughs> so, so since Why last, is this gibberish? Since, since last November, uh, this Voyager 1 probe has been sending unreadable science and engineering data, and they've now figured out, uh, they think, the reason why this is happening. It was a small portion of corrupted memory in the flight data subsystem. This is a lot of technical language here. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, so that is the computer responsible for packaging the data before being sent before the data is being sent. Yeah. So they're going to, it's supposedly just a single chip that it's come down to. And so hopefully if they fix or replace that chip, they'll be good to go. Yeah. What's interesting is like, if you're not using like ECC memory or whatever, which, I mean, this went out in the, what, the late seventies, mm -hmm. right? This, this Voyager was launched off into the, into the great beyond back in the late seventies. So it didn't have maybe the, the same protections, but like just background radiation of the, of the universe will change bits in processors and things like that. It'll kind of flip things over and, and, and make it go weird. So it's highly probable that that's exactly what's happening, yeah. is that it just kind of messed it up. Also, it's made in the 70s, right? It, it was launched in the, in the late 70s, but God knows how long before it was, like, right, right yeah. actually built. It might have been sitting on a shelf for two years before they stuck it in the thing and, and fired it off in a rocket. 
So, I mean, it, Voyager's been a, an amazing... I, I, I would be interested to know whether or not they were able to flip it back and figure out what the gibberish is, says. Oh, yeah. Right? And, yeah, and then point. get the actual data of... Well, because right now it's just garbage. Like decorrupted or whatever, right, decorrupted. The, whatever the term would be. Yeah. yeah. And it, it did mention, like you said, could could just be the age because yeah. it is 40-something years old. Or it could have been that it was hit by an energetic particle from space. That sounds so much cooler. Yeah. Why was it data That's gibberish? The well, there was an energetic yeah. particle from space that hit the chip. And, you know, that you sounds know, so much cooler. I hate it when that happens. That, don't you hate it when an energetic yeah. particle from space? Story oldest time, right? Yeah, it truly is. <laughs> This was the the first human-made object to enter interstellar space, so that's pretty that's cool. Right. That's but right. it also means it is going to be a challenge uh, to debug and fix this. It might take weeks or months until they find a way to make it operate normally. So until that point, they might still have to deal with that gibberish data. i, I got to be honest, man. This is the kind of stuff that makes me excited about being a Hackspace Con. Yeah. Right? Because it. I was a kid. I was totally into space. I loved astronauts and rockets and satellites and anything that has to do with that. One of my favorite movies is The Martian. Super fun, right? Anything to do with the Apollo 13, you name it, the right stuff. Yeah. All all some of the things that just kind of really turn the old beanie for Daniel. Yeah. So this kind I of like stuff, this stuff. This is the kind of stuff that makes me the most excited for Hackspace Con. This is the thing that makes me the second most excited. It's they cool, us, right? They gave us little rocket ships. So they did. It's a good, that's a nice perk. Yeah, you know, it's a nice perk. Uh, this this is the badge, by the way. It's not just like yeah. a toy that I have hanging from my neck. Yeah. It is the badge. I don't know. Are we allowed to show that? Can sure. we do that? It's public knowledge. Man, if, right? if, you, if you can make this in the time it takes to see the episode, <laughs> fabricate a fake badge, then yes, you deserve to go to Hackspace Con for free. Disclaimer, we're kidding. <laughs> yeah. Your skills are amazing. <laughs> Hell. <laughs> I'm trying to get kicked out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, uh, this next one might look a little bit familiar to you. I know we've mentioned uh, some WordPress stuff over the last several weeks. Seems like there have been a lot of issues with various plugins. And in this case, there is a critical security flaw that exposes 1 million WordPress sites to SQL injection or SQL injection. Uh, I feel like I need to say this in the doctor. You email. actually said that right. SQL is correct. Oh, okay. But it become it has become like common more fun. vernacular to say SQL. SQL, from, if I'm getting it, I know the comment section will, will bust my head open if, if I'm wrong on this. But if I'm remembering correctly, SQL is only Microsoft SQL. Microsoft, MSSQL. Really? They have like, if I'm not mistaken, they trademarked oh. the, the term SQL. If it's not trademarked, it's just their verbiage okay. for Microsoft SQL. But everybody just says SQL because it's easier. I guess I'll shut up then because I don't want to get sued by Microsoft. Yeah. You get the big red machine. <laughs> Redmond coming after my you. Door. Yeah, yeah, Bill Gates. Bill, Bill Gates himself. What are you doing, that. Sophia? <laughs> Is that how he talks? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's just then. He's the pregnant man, right? He's, he's, he's the pregnant man emoji. <laughs> Have you ever seen that picture? It's so funny. Christian, you got to get on that, man. Yeah, there's a picture of Bill Gates, and he's wearing like a blue shirt, and he's he's kind of got a dad bod going on. Okay. And he literally looks like the pregnant man emoji. God, okay. Yeah. I'll see. So I'll funny. see if I can find it after this article. I'll see if I can pull up a picture of it, and it's, I don't it's know. Maybe hysterical. we'll have to censor it. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, the person, the researcher that discovered this, uh, received a $5,500 bug bounty, which to me, maybe I don't know much about bug bounty reward systems, but this plugin that has more than a million active installations that's being affected by this vulnerability, he got $5,500 mm. for finding this bug. I feel like that's a little disproportionate. I mean, $5,500 is nothing to sneeze at. But for a million WordPress sites being affected by this, I don't know. I, we're going to talk about something later where they're offering millions of dollars another company is you know, for this, bugs, bug bounties. So this to me seems like a small amount. Listen, there's going to be a couple of bug bounty hunters here. Oh, really? Of, yes, yes. All like right. Jason Haddix and Nahumsek. Maybe we can corner them and be like, Ooh, yeah. what do you think about how much yeah. they got in that? Do you think that's an appropriate payout for this level of... Of a yeah. bug, based off of your experience and know-how on these things. Yeah, based on so. the the bug bounty economy, yeah. if you will. What's the norm? Right, they've got a little more yeah, yeah. more knowledge. I'll be interested of that. in, in uh, chatting the air off on that one. Yeah, yeah. And this vulnerability was uh, the security flaw has a rating of nine point eight out of ten. So it's not even like this is uh, it's just a little thing. Like pretty pretty severe. Yeah. Uh, that is that is one of the highest. I don't know. Out well, of 10. I would also like to to point out that like every now and then I read our comments, uh -huh. right? And I I did a video I don't know a few years ago. And it was where it included a SQL injection. I was doing like a CTF in 15 minutes or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And there was a SQL injection in the CTF. And someone commented, uh, yeah, SQL injection, like if this was 2003. What day is this? <laughs> how, how many days old are we when we realize SQL injections are still a thing? They still yeah. happen. That's still a major part of like a lot of the courses we have. It's still a major part yeah. of like uh, certification exams and stuff. It, because they still do the still, thing. Yeah. Now this is a, a blind based time based SQL injection, right? Okay. So that's what is that like? Uh, you have to put something in there that's like 
okay, delay this by 10 seconds. And right. then if it so delays, it's, then you know. It's nice when you can go, okay, you know, or one equals one, and things come back, or you see things mess up on the website. But that doesn't always happen. Sometimes things happen, but you don't see them happen. Mm. But you want to verify whether or not your SQL injection was valid. So what you'll do is you'll say, hey, wait a certain amount of time. Obviously, I say obviously. Uh, typically, you'll use something like a sleep function. Sleep and then do X, Y, or Z for me. If sleep works, then the probability is high that your SQL injection was valid and worked and did the thing you think it should do. Okay? If it does not sleep, then it, it just goes through. It, it probably just threw your, your SQL uh, injection away and said, I don't know what to do with this. It didn't work or whatever because it did not do the sleep. Okay. If it does the sleep, that's your verification that things are working. Okay, gotcha. So, and that's why they call it blind. I don't see anything, so I have to use kind of, it's kind of like finding black holes, right? Where we look at the, the or, or other suns or other uh, planets, we look for things wobbling around. We look for indicators that something is there because we can't see it. Right. It's the same kind of idea. And the danger here, for, for those who might not know, when you are exploiting something like this, you could potentially extract sensitive information, right? That's the danger. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So once once I know that my SQL injection is working, now I'm going to start going after the database itself. I want to extract the information from the database. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I could even possibly parlay that into remote access. Mm -hmm. So lots of lots of danger behind SQL injection. That's why I'm like, 5500 bucks, like you say, nothing to sneeze at. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I guess they would know better on the extent of the, the capabilities and what, what database they had access to, what records they were going to have access to through this SQL injection. And maybe it wasn't super sensitive information. Yeah, that's true. But it's still a bug in their platform and a pretty good one. So it's worth, I mean, what was the, it did tell it was, us, right? Was, Attackers yeah. can exploit. Uh, like the amount that they were paying? Like what could it do? Oh, gotcha. Um, what, what were they doing with the... Possible to append additional SQL queries or SQL queries into already existing queries to extract sensitive information, but I don't know if they got super specific with the information that, that you could take out. Because right. you're extract right. Extract sensitive information from the database. If it's email addresses, I mean, that's still not good, but... If I'd it's passwords have... and email addresses, that's even worse. Right. <laughs> or like credit card information. Like right. Like that, obviously. Right. Be, obviously, you, you know. don't want that. Right. So, uh, but yeah, it was this guy, his username was, I think wannabe elite or elite wannabe or something so shouts out to him he's making his way he's making his way downtown <laughs> walking no fast doubt. faces pass that's right uh fifty five hundred dollars nothing to sneeze at all right cool so uh and wordpress does account for i think 40 something percent of all websites on the internet so this yeah. is when yeah, you it's kind see of a, a big, wordpress it's the, the ron burgundy of hacks here it's kind of a big deal <laughs> <laughs> oh boy yeah you're right you're right well we've got another segment here uh this is another favorite of ours we're gonna be talking about avanti again because this is deja news Deja News. Yeah, yeah, I'm correct. You're okay. correct. So they uh, they are pledging a security overhaul over at Avanti because four more vulnerabilities were disclosed uh, just the other day, just a, just a few days ago. And uh, we're going to be talking about this in a second. But these are already being exploited, these vulnerabilities, uh, <laughs> by some pretty big, yeah. pretty big names. Yeah. Uh, pretty big contenders. So they've... Uh, the CEO penned an open letter to customers committed to a series of changes in the company. They're going to make these changes in the coming months to transform their security. What do, what do you think about that? How likely do you think this is? Oh, so I, I, I feel like it is likely that they are going to go in and overhaul the code. Absolutely. Yeah. I believe that that is, that is true statement. Okay. Um, that said, I mean, that's like basically saying, we're going to take this old jalopy that we told you was awesome and we're going to make it into the thing we told you it mm. originally was. So, I mean, this is week what that we've talked about, Avanti, right? And here they are yeah. throwing out four more CVEs related to their products, which, like you said, is kind of apropos because, and, and a good thing that, that you're finding them and, and working on it because you've got... Chinese hackers are yes. currently attacking and taking advantage of said flaws mm -hmm. in your systems. Yeah, there were the researchers that said multiple China hacker groups are currently exploiting these flaws. This is a separate article, but same same kind of thing. China Nexus threat actors have been linked to the zero-day exploitation of three of those flaws impacting the Avanti appliances. So four disclosed, three already being exploited by these bigger groups. So cool. that is reassuring. I'm really excited about that. Yeah, so good for Avanti for getting on oh, this sure. now absolutely but man you know so I, I think i was talking with don about this you know because we've we've seen a lot of fortinet we've seen a lot of avanti and, and and other companies that continue to have 
security issues week after week or, or, or very close together. Uh, you know, he was saying how it kind of can come from when a, a corporate entity starts acquiring software. So you were mom and pop shop building something cool. A large company comes along and says, man, I like that cool thing you got there. I'll give you $10 million for it. And they go, heck yeah, take that. Give me that 10 million. You know, that's, that's a great payday for a tech startup. Now they, they get that money. They, maybe a few of them stay on the team and come over and become a part of a large corporate entity. And then it, it ceases to be as awesome mm -hmm. as it once was because they just start packaging and slapping things together and, and, and bundling things together. So that doesn't happen all the time, but it can happen. I don't know if that's what happened here, yeah. but it could be one of the possible explanations for why we're seeing a lot of things. They're, they're just pulling in different software and then slapping the Avanti name on it. Again, yep. I don't know if that's what's happening, but it, it's it a possibility. Be. It could be. And as far as the, the bugs themselves go, it was two that uh, could cause denial of service at, uh, conditions on affected systems. So that's never good. Those were, I think, medium severity. But the other two were heap overflow vulnerabilities that were characterized as pretty high severity. So we're, it's a, it's all about balance. Yeah. Avanti. Heap cool. overflow, no good. That's where you get right. them buffer overflows. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So buffer overflow lead to remote code execution. Mm -hmm. Remote code execution lead to, uh-oh. To, uh -oh. uh, yeah, go, go ahead and call the number of that instant. What's that instant response team number? It's very technical term. We're gonna need to get that out. Remote code execution lead to uh -oh. that's our yeah. that's our title for this <laughs> for this episode, and it's you just going like yeah, this in the just... thumbnail. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, like I mentioned earlier, well, first of all, I did find the Bill Gates pregnant man, whatever. You can actually get this as a sticker on Redbubble. So. Yeah, it was just super funny. And then somebody went the extra mile and uh, just literally put his face on oh, it. Oh, I clicked on it. Awesome. Oh, okay. now, now you got yourself it's gonna a be in my search nice history. malware. It's awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> Bill, pregnant Bill Gates malware. Yeah, that's awesome. That's it. Uh, so like we mentioned earlier, uh, we're talking about the bug bounty. How uh, We thought that the $5,500 was nothing to sneeze at, but interesting yeah. amount. There is a different company offering much, much more. And we've decided to make this part of our segment that's been long lost, the crow segment. Oh, I love it. Uh, he looks so happy. He truly, I wish we could have brought the crow with us to Hackspace. Huh? Smartest of all birds. He would have been running into the window repeatedly. So it's good that we didn't. But uh, this one says, companies offering $30 million, that is, for Android iOS browser zero-day exploits. And the reason that we decided to make this a crow segment is because down here, that looks to me like it should be crow <laughs> defense. Yeah. I know that's not how it's pronounced, but that's it looks right. like it should be. So Crows should, need you know, defense, too. They do. Right? You're right. To protect They've the been running a good offense, but without a great defense, they're not going to win that game. Like they're the Gators football team. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, we don't have a good offense or defense, no. actually. So no. anyway, so this this uh, it's an exploit acquisition firm, which I didn't know was a was a thing. They're offering a total of $30 million for any of these zero days. Uh, and I just have to wonder why? Why? For what? Why are you offering so much money for these zero days? What are you going to do? That is a great question, right? So Pwn to Own, mm -hmm. right? That's a that's a great uh, research and development or uh, uh, exploit research kind of platform, and I think so. We, we reported on that, and there was something like right around a million dollars that they they paid out. Yes, right, which is a lot. It was a lot. Who's paying out those those bounties? So Microsoft, Tesla, right, Firefox, Chrome, right. like all these all these big organizations are saying, hey, if if you're finding flaws in our stuff. We'll pay you a good bounty for it. We got this competition going on. You get these points. We gamified it. It's really cool. It's really fun. This is just a, a an organization that says, we will pay you for zero days. And we will pay you well. So, okay, let's say you pay me, what was it, $3 million <laughs> for an iOS zero-day vulnerability uh, for full-chain previously un unreported reports. What you doing with that? What's yeah. what you, what you doing with those iOS zero days? If you're willing to pay me three million bucks for it, you obviously are making money. Yeah, what kind of return are you getting on that? I investment? just don't know how you're doing it. This is a, Maybe I just need to do my research into crow defense. But, but I don't blame you for being cynical because it's like, why? I am a cynic. It's too good to be true. I know you're not doing this out of the goodness of your heart. So why right. offer so much money unless there's yeah. something in it for you? I doubt highly they're just sticking it on a shelf and going, right. we're just a philanthropist. We just want to help. Yeah, we we'll we'll put out. these off the in, the, in the vault. But yeah. the If you were a loved one, <laughs> have a zero day for <laughs> iOS. <laughs> you may be entitled <laughs> to up to $9 million yeah. for yeah. successful Call submission. JG Malware. Oh. I mean, uh, Wentworth. <laughs> <laughs> it's my malware and I need it now. That's right. <laughs> 
So, uh, so they did say payouts for full chains or previously unreported exclusive capabilities range from 10000 to $9 million U.S. dollars, uh, but only fully functional, top quality, zero-day exploits will be evaluated. So at least they've got standards. Oh, They're yeah. not taking any any, any janky zero days that no. kind of work. Only the best. They want the, for the best folks over at Crow Defense. It makes me think of like, and okay, I, I'm not putting the two together. I'm just saying it makes me think of the NSO group mm-hmm. that they specialize in their Pegasus software, and their Pegasus software was to do with they have their own researchers with zero days for iOS and Android, and then if you purchase a license for Pegasus, you can then use that software to access those devices you do your research that's true yeah. you, you draw your own conclusions i'm, yeah, I'm, right, well, I'm, we'll I'm gonna say good or bad things i'm just gonna say there that is we'd love to hear what y'all think about yeah. any of the articles we've covered if you've got your own theories your own questions yeah. and comments we would love for you to leave those down below and if you or a loved one have discovered a top quality zero day exploit you may be entitled to financial compensation yeah, apparently so <laughs> But I think we are going to take a quick break. We do have a deep dive coming up here on Technado. I know. Gotta, he's got to go wipe the sweat from his brow. So we'll take a quick break. We'll be right back here at HackspaceCon with more Technado. Tired of trying to schedule your team's time around in-person learning? Isn't it a bummer to spend thousands of dollars on travel for professional development? What if we said you can save money and time and still provide your team with the best training possible? The answer to your woes is live online training from ACI Learning. With live online training, we provide our top in-person courses in private, online, instructor-led formats. You get to provide professional development in a manner that fits today's expectations. Entertaining, convenient, and effective. Our exam-aligned courses inspire the full potential of your team. Visit virtual instructor-led training at ACI Learning for more info. Welcome back. Thanks for sticking with us through that break. Really quick, if you are watching on YouTube, we are close to hitting a milestone. I just want to mention it before I forget. We're so close. I think we're like less than 50 away from hitting 150,000. I think we're at like 30-something. Yeah. 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 So hopefully we can hit that milestone. If you haven't subscribed yet, consider doing so. Um, we'd love to have you join us every week for a new episode. And you can join the Technado family. We, uh, we get ice cream every Thursday. Yeah. I'm just kidding. No, we don't. You yeah. have to go buy it yourself. Yeah. But, and then you sit and, and then watch you the can show have it. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll That'd be kind of a fun thing if we started doing ice cream. Yeah. While we ice do cream the Thursdays. Show. It just, yeah, of course, of course, yeah. It's kind of early in the morning. It's like we're back in school. <laughs> we're going to have a pizza party and ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> you, t- you finish the FCAT and you get right. your ice cream. That's, that's the it. that's the trade off. Speaking See, of ice. We didn't have FCATs. We had CTBS. Oh, that's right. Because you, you weren't a Florida kid, were you? Yeah. Was a kid? Mm hmm. Was okay. So I guess I. was no FCAT when I was a kid. It was all CTBS testing. Okay. Yeah, see, I, I had to take the FCAT. It was fine. It wasn't that bad. Showing my age. It, yeah. <laughs> Old. Back in my day. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of ice cream, and more specifically ice, I did mention earlier, we did have an article that, that had to do with ice. Our deep dive today is titled Lactrodectus, which is a fun word. This spider bites like ice. I just know they had a great time writing that headline. Yeah. So, so. Lactro, like, I, I was just, the whole time I'm reading this article, I'm like, so Pterodactrus, uh, <laughs> Lactose Intolerantritis, you know, I'm just like, That's what is good. the name of this thing? <laughs> it's such an <laughs> odd name. I wonder what that means, honestly. We should have probably Googled that. That's true. Before we got into this. Well, I can, I can Google but it. You, you Google, you yeah. go over there touching your screen, getting yeah. crazy. Okay, I'm sorry. You, I'm you, sorry. You can break the stuff. It's not right? a touch screen. Pixie dust. It's Pixie dust. <laughs> It's it's a it's a new malware, but as far as the root, I'm not sure. So it I'll look into a, that. It is a new malware. You look up Lacrodactylus, Lollipopadopolis, hmm. and and well, you got it already. It says a genus of nearly cosmopolitan spiders. So they wear cute dresses. Oh yeah. Nearly cosmopolitan spiders of the family Therididae, or ther- yeah, yeah. That includes most of the well-known venomous spiders, like the black widow. Spiders in the city. Spiders in the city. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> Oh, so, fun. So that makes sense. This spider bites like ice, Lactrodectus. I'm seeing the connection here We now. start to get it now. And I know this is malware, right, and it's appearing in email threat campaigns. Is there anything specific about this malware that, that sets it apart from your just run-of-the-mill malware? You know, th- there's always something interesting. And that's why we kind of do these deep dives is to start to learn. Yeah, hopefully, if, if you've been watching Technado since we've started doing the deep dive section, the whole purpose of it is to start to see patterns, Right to look and see how are our um, attackers, how are our enemies out there uh, coming at us? What what is their standard way in which they're doing it? You should start to have picked up a few patterns. Right, we typically have some sort of phishing campaign that these things begin with. And what's really interesting about this is you know, so I, I, I've been at other cons, I've talked to other hackers, and you know, uh, a friend of mine, Jacob from Dark Wolf, he does exploit development. 
That's that's his. That's what he does every day. He okay. looks for exploits. He looks for zero days, and specifically in Android, which is kind of funny. He could get some of that money. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> right, that we talked about earlier. But that's that's a very specific thing. It's very difficult. But that's not typically what a lot of of hacking is in real life land. In real life land, it's malware. Malware is what they use. You, I don't have to find some sort of crazy problem in your operating system or some software that you're using and exploit that. I just exploit you. I come after you. So where does that begin? It begins with social engineering, phishing, right? This is no different. It, it only differs in what their fish is. Like what is the lure that they use to try to get you to bite on it so they can snag you and pull you in. Right. And this one was an interesting one, I thought, and I, and I was kind of seeing this one making its way around the headlines from different places. They were using the idea that you have violated a copyright, right? They were acting oh. as copyright lawyers, giving you a cease and desist, and follow the link, and you'll see where you have violated our copyright. Oh. Click at a link. Ruh row, now you're down the malware rabbit hole. That's pretty creative because usually I feel like I think of malware and it's like you've won a vacation or you're, this is your bank and there's been a big a big withdrawal from your account. It's very like money centric or very urgency. This is something though that especially like if you're a creative type or whatever and you, right. you've got stuff that you're doing, even if just it's like a YouTube channel that you're running and oh shoot, I'm getting copyright stricken for something that I said or did. Yeah, it's gonna it's still gonna create that sense of urgency. Yeah, but you don't think of that kind of stuff when you think malware. So yeah, this is kind of this is a dangerous one. Yeah, I would think. And it does say that uh, I'm looking through. It says it's first observed being distributed by TA577. So I'm not sure if this is a, a threat actor that we've discussed before, because unfortunately I don't have them memorized by number. I wish that I did. Uh, but they used it in at least three campaigns in November 2023. Uh, but since mid-January, it's being almost exclusively used by a separate threat acting group, TA578, in email threat campaigns. And we just love to see that. Yeah, and it's, it's just... The evolution of malware, you start to see this a lot where it kind of goes from one thing to the next and kind of, or, you know, maybe a, a malware group will kind of splinter off mm -hmm. from uh, from their main group and start creating their own malware. But you'll see a lot of vestigial code coming from the previous versions mm -hmm. making its way because it's like, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I've got something that works really well. I just now need to kind of modify it, make it a little bit different. And honestly, as, as AV and EDR and XDR systems start to catch wind of of your malware and start to block said malware, you have to constantly evolve it or it's not going to be effective. It's not going to work as well as it once did. And since most of these folks are, you know, this is their stock and trade, this is how they make their money, that is not what they would want to do is have it be like, well, I just sold this and it doesn't work. No one's going to buy it after that. So they have to continually evolve these things. So we, we do see this as that. Now, from what I'm reading here, it says that... Um, they have seen at least a dozen campaigns delivering Lactrodectacidococcus beginning in February 2024, which is not that long ago. The malware is used by actors uh, access to be initial access brokers, IABs. That's that's right around uh, that region right there. So IABs, this is this is what these people are doing. So an IAB is, let's say that you have maybe you run ransomware as a service, or you're running some sort of hacking as a service. Getting that initial access into the system is one of the tougher things to do. So do you want to spend all your time doing that or do you want to work on your dashboards and selling to customers yeah. and, and servicing customer requests and all the things you do? They actually run, you know, hacking like a business. No, I'll outsource it. That's what an IAB is. They're like, you know what? We've done all the heavy lifting of getting access into systems. What system would you like access to? We'll check our, our coffers and see if they're in there. Hmm, let me run through the database. Oh, yes, we do have access into Bob's tires. I don't know why you want access there, but you, we've got it. He clicked the fish. We got the malware in. It's all good. There you go. Now you have access. And you, you basically pay them for the service that they've already done. So this is what they're doing. This is the, they don't seem to care to do too much after the fact because that's not their job. Their job is to get access, maintain access, and have C2 communications ready to go. And all you got to do is go, okay, now I can sell this. So that's what initial access brochures are doing. Says the malware is first observed by uh, being distributed by TA fifty seven five uh, seven seven, and the IAB known as a prolific QBot or CACBot. There's a lot of different ways. QBot is a very well known uh, initial access brochure and malware hmm. uh, distributed prior to the malware's disruption. 
2023. So um, using it in at least uh, three campaigns, like you said, since November, uh, before reverting to Peekabot. Interesting. Oh, cute. Cute name. Peekabot. Peekabot. Cute name for a not-so-cute thing. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking down at the, uh, I know you mentioned that it was like a, a copyright infringement accusation that was kind of what they were using to get you to click on this thing. And initially I was like, wow, that, that might be a little more convincing. After reading it, I could still see how somebody would fall for this, but there are some things that I'm like, like, first of all, it's all in the first person. It's, I have a strong self-belief that you are violating our copyright, and I swear under consequence of... I don't think I've ever gotten an email that's, like, a very official... It's usually like, good evening, on behalf of the company, we, or the company, it's mm. almost never first person, like, direct like that. You've never gotten a cease and desist. You're right, I haven't. So are they usually written in the first person? Uh, I don't know if they're usually written in the first person. I, I, I don't feel like it wouldn't... It would be out of the realm of possibilities, but they are usually very strongly worded. Like, right. you must stop. Yeah, well, sure. Like, like you I must think, stop now. I think oh. it was more the the first person that was getting me. Like, oh, this is the weirdness. Of I the, demand the elimination. I'm like, you specifically <laughs> demanded. You legal officer, you. So that's I find it me. interesting that that's something that your brain cued on was the fact that it was written in the first person. I just don't think I've ever gotten a very official email that was legitimate. That was if anybody's ever received, uh, received a cease and desist, do you get Educate it in the me. first person? Right. Educate me in a is kind manner. Goes? Educate me. I I personally have not received a cease and desist, but I have been in the middle of filming content and have gotten the stop. The door opened and it was stop. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> Immediately stop. And, and we got a cease and desist, which Aww. ended up being a nothing burger. Cease and desists are kind of like whoop de doo Prove I did something <laughs> wrong. Like if I'm doing something wrong, I'm probably going to stop at that point. Yeah. But in real life land, if you get a cease and desist and you're not doing anything wrong, just keep going. They haven't proven anything yet. You might want to stop for the moment and investigate whether or not you might be, but that's where they get you here with their with their fish is to go, well, here's how I can prove you're breaking the law. Yeah. And and breaking the law is a really good motivator of fear and urgency and so on and so forth. So to me, it was a pretty good social engineer. Yeah. I mean, there's, of course, always going to be the, you know, there's little grammatical mistakes that you can see. There's a really big, long, suspicious looking link. So that kind of stuff can be can be indicators. But that's just the first part of it. That's just the email you receive that's got this link. And if you click on the link, well, then you're in trouble. So let's just say I receive this email. I'm not paying attention. I get worried. I click on the link. What happens then? All right. From there, it is going to. So you download the dropper. So once you click the mm -hmm. link, it downloads a dropper. If you're not familiar with droppers. Droppers are. Basically, they, they drop malware. A lot of times, they don't do anything specifically malicious. They reach out and grab things that do specifically malicious things. But that is to evade uh, checking of, of, well, are you doing something malicious? No, I'm just talking to the Internet. Who doesn't talk to the Internet? Lots of Internet <laughs> talking going on all day. How is my stuff any different? Mm -hmm. Right? And honestly, most of these, unless you are reaching out to a known uh, malicious entity, it's probably going to go, well, yeah, I mean, we do a lot of internet talking. There's no doubt. Yeah. And you seem to be doing the exact same thing. So what do droppers do? They look and they, so a lot of malware will have their own specific infrastructure built up that has not been known. A lot of this comes in. In malware campaigns, the malware developers will have to spin up custom new infrastructure that have never been used before so that they can you know, bypass any EDR. Sure. They're not known to be malicious. Mm -hmm. You're not going to go to Virus Total, slap their their domain name in there and go, yes, this is known malicious. It's going to go. Yeah. There's no known problem with this. Looks okay to me. Yeah. So that's what the dropper typically does. Uh, this one also makes sure to check, and this is something that we see more and more when it comes to malware, is it looks to see, am I in a sandbox? Are you oh. analyzing to see whether or not I'm malware? Huh. Smart. Yeah, that's interesting. So then if, if in theory, you are opening it in a sandbox, does the way that it acts change? Oh, uh, yeah. It starts going, I'm done. See you guys later. And it backs away <laughs> into the into the you know ether and disappears, deletes itself. Oh. And usually that kind of stuff. I, I didn't see whether or not it did that, if it that's detected any kind of um, uh, analysis that's going on. But here's what it does. It says, if it's in a Windows 10 or new, so it looks to see what device am I am I on? So if it's Windows 10 or newer, it must have at least 75 running processes because that would be something that's actually happening on a, a, an end user system. If I'm running in a sandbox, you're you're not going to see this many processes running. It's it's highly unlikely, right? If it's earlier than Windows 10, it looks for 50 because I guess that would be a little more in line with something uh, in the Windows 8, 7, and and previous. 
than it does ensure that 64 Apple, uh, the 64-bit application is running on a 64-bit host because apparently this is 64-bit code. If it's not, obviously that's going to make it a little difficult for it to do much. So it's going to look for that and ensure that the host has a valid MAC address. If you look at MAC addresses for virtualized uh, devices, they typically have a virtualized MAC address. As you remember, that whole first couple of characters in a MAC address is the identifier, <coughs> excuse me, of the manufacturer. Mm. If that's VMware. Yeah. Well, and, and before it even gets to the point where it's it's doing something that's obviously malicious, like you said, it, it does this check to see if it's running in a sandbox. Uh, I think it says it's environment checks. Then it does something called a mutex check. So it, I guess the malware always registers a mutex called R Runung. <laughs> How you would pronounce that? It's it's up here. Runung. That is a fun name for it. If the mutex already exists, then the host already infected. So I guess that means malware doesn't have to worry about it, and it can dip. Yeah. So a mutex is a mutually exclusive. It's a onomatopoeia, right? Like is that, oh, like an you, acronym? Uh, not an acronym. It's where you take two things. It's not oh, onomatopoeia. Portmanteau. portmanteau. Thank you. That you you slap two words together. Mm -hmm. It's mutually. Uh, exclusive something or other. I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it, it's a portmanteau of two different words. Yeah, do the do the look up do on the that. Google. And they just use that because it makes it to where only one thread can access this at a time, so you can't be multiply like, coming at it and taking it. It's it's against so kind of helps keep things where it wants to be and no other threads coming in and and checking things or uh, trying to in. What's the word I'm looking for? Interject, like, hey, mm. let's stop. Uh, might, might be causing problems. It wants to make sure that the code runs. Okay. It does say, um, I Googled it, mutual mutual exclusion. Is mutual what exclusion. Mutex that's what it means. Is, is representative yeah. of. So it's checking to make sure there's nothing that's going to get in the way, nothing that's going to interrupt its its processes, right? And then it says it goes through something called global variable initialization. So it's initializing variables for the campaign. Yep. Uh, so this is the, including the current user's username, a handle to its own file, campaign ID. So, and, but again, this is all, it's almost like it's, it's prep work for what the malware is going to do. Right? That's right, because it needs to eventually connect to the C2. Right. Right. But think, pretend you're a C2 or a malware developer all of a sudden, right? Put that hat on. Yeah. Okay. And you're like, okay, I've gotten, I've gotten access to a machine. It's reached out, it's talked to me. And now somebody else clicks the malware. How do I know the difference between the two? I have to have some sort of unique identification for each one of my devices. This is, the, like you said, the prep work that's kind of going on underneath the scenes to create some sort of unique identifier for each one of the targets. So okay. once it, it gains access to the machine and reaches out to C2, C2 can now kind of go, well, I've got this machine, i got that machine, i got that machine, and it's able to reference them as necessary. So if I only want one machine or ten machines to do what I need them to do, I can make that reference and have that action happen. Okay, so it, you, you, there's a unique ID for each unique host the malware is installed on. It's like it, yep. each host gets its own unique American Girl doll. Yeah. It's just like you <laughs> and only for you. That's, that's I get that reference because I have two girls. There you go. <laughs> See, if we're finally we're finding yeah. some common ground common with the ground. pop culture. Coming together. Uh, let me know when you watch the Kit Kitteridge movie, and then and then okay. we can talk. Yeah, real ones. No, it's an American. Uh, we're girl going doll. to get a Judy doll soon. Are you familiar Judy. with Judy's Judy? Judy might be a new one. Yeah, they're, I'm not familiar with that one. Like a, I don't know. My, my daughter's obsessed with it. So. Oh, I'll be Googling that. I'll be doing some Googling <laughs> later. So after it does generate a, a unique ID for each unique host, uh, then it looks like it converts it to a string. And then we start getting into, they start mentioning C2. C2 servers yep. being decrypted, so this is where it starts to get a, a, a wee bit scary. Yep, it's got some hard-coded information inside of the code there. It's got to extract where am I supposed to reach out and who am I supposed to reach out to. It's going to have a list of those C2 servers. It's like, hey, you're possible, you're possible. Or maybe one C2 server does one thing and one another C2 server does another. It can, it can vary depending on the malware. But ultimately, again, you start to see patterns emerge when we uh, start an analyzing different malware but kind of doing the same thing. Maybe it's just doing it in a little bit different way, but it, you're going to see a lot of the same things. So we're going to use a fish to gain access. Once I gain access, I'm going to check for virtualization and, and make sure that I'm not being analyzed. If I am, I want to pull the ripcord and get the heck out of there, right? Don't want to do any of the analysis stuff. We're going to put the kibosh on that. Okay, so I'm not being analyzed. Great. Now I can actually start doing stuff. Maybe I go up for stage two or three, maybe both. And continuing on, ultimately, though, I need to connect with my C2 server and let them know and beacon back and say, hey, I'm alive, I'm ready, I'm willing, I'm able, let me know, put me in the game, coach, and make that happen. Now, here we see that's kind of wrapped up in encryption, 
they're using some encryption mechanisms throughout this malware. And I think there was some Zor encryption going on and, and some sort of rotational uh, ciphering that was occurring as well. But ultimately, at the end of the day, they're using that encryption. And most malware will use, or I say most, some malware will use uh, encryptions to bypass antivirus, EDR, XDR systems. Because you can't read jumbled up junk, mm. right? Even though the keys are like hard-coded into the malware, which is like, it makes it easy for us. You got to remember, computers don't think like we do. If I see an encryption key, I go, cool. Well, I mean, you gave me the decryption key. I can just decrypt this. But in a program, an application, it's not going to decrypt that until it's already slapped in the memory. And from there, it's highly unlikely that your antivirus systems are able to touch it at that point. It's kind of abstracted away from it. It can't see it. But now it's being decrypted. It's doing something in memory. It's not on the disk. It's all uh, fileless at this point. Now, I know there are still, there's, it, it breaks it down really step by step in this article, which comes to us from Proofpoint, and there's still several more steps to go. Oh, yeah. But, but obviously, this is, you know, once you click on the link, it just goes. Like, it's not like it requires assistance from the user for this to happen. So I know it takes a little bit to go through each step and to understand how it works. In, in real life, in a real life situation, if this is happening, how long do you think it probably takes for all of these steps to occur? Moments. Really? Yeah. It, it doesn't take very long. Now, they might, if they're smart, they'll probably bake in some some time, some weight, some slow and low. Let it let it simmer. So it's not sus. Yeah, let it simmer on the on the on the oven there, right? On the on the on the oh. range, okay. as it were, right? Because the faster these things happen, the more likely it is for behavioral analysis to kind of kick in and go. Well, uh. What's all this, right? So your a your AV might not see anything malicious on disk. And it might not check or see anything even malicious, obviously, in memory because that's a lot more, that's more difficult to detect. But behaviorally, those systems will start going, hmm, it's weird. Yeah. And I, you know what my rule is for weird? Turn it off. Mm -hmm. Right? Make it stop. So it's, it's usually a good idea to kind of bake in some time, let it simmer, let it go slow and low, and then do something because they don't have forever to wait. And an, an AV sure. system will start bogging down CPU and memory and all that stuff as it analyzes each different process, especially if it's doing behavioral analysis. That can take some time, and that can take processes. And now, all of a sudden, your end user is getting super upset with their experience with their system. So they try to have to, try to, have to find some balance between performance and efficiency and effectiveness. Okay. So if you're a good malware dev, you prey on that and say, I got all the time in the world. Yeah. I'm going to make it wait 10 minutes before it actually does anything malicious. Because mm -hmm. you've clicked on a link and it, you're, you're probably not any of the wiser that anything's happening. You're just, right. oh, okay, well, link happened and doesn't look like it's anything, so I'll just delete the email. So a lot of this, like you said, is, is checks of the environment. It's prep work. How much of this does it go through before it gets to the actual, all right, we're ready to go? Uh, with this specific malware? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. What is it doing? Uh, I, so they, they have I, didn't, I didn't count. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 17 steps. Yeah, there's 17 um, steps. No, there's a, it, it goes through the different checks, you know, bot ID to string. Then it says C2 decryption. The C2 servers are decrypted. Then it I, goes into. I think my browser blocked all those pictures. I don't Aww, have any of them. You don't have the pictures. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. You see, I got that security turned up pretty high. So I don't. It blocked all the. All the <laughs> I am using Firefox. <laughs> yeah, not you're secure. getting. <laughs> I am using Firefox, but. I have a couple of extensions as well. well uh, but he, he knows more than I do. Th that, that doesn't matter. Ultimately. At the end of the day, what we want to see is not necessarily uh, – it's, it's looking for those patterns and seeing how it is similar and how it is dissimilar and what are the specific things that we can key on to identify this as malware for our defensive systems. Mm -hmm. And that's what always – the end of the article is always the best part of that, right? Because it gives us those IOCs, those indicators of compromise. So definitely want to look through that. Another cool thing about it, though, is just its capabilities. What can it do? Mm -hmm. So uh, you can you can maybe use those as a, an indicator as well, is if I see this type of activity on my machine, maybe that's um, that's something that I, I want to get to. But as a – as someone who does malware analysis and wants to look at malware and see what it can do, I can I can see these different commands that laparoscopic <laughs> surgery can do, which is uh, <laughs> we can get the <laughs> file names of files on the desktop. We can get a list of running processes, send additional system information, execute executables, uh, execute DLLs with a given export. We can pass strings to CMD and execute a lot of a lot to do with executing uh, stuff for us here in this malware. 
update the bot and trigger a restart. That's nice to go, hey, we've, we've, we've made this bigger, better, stronger. We might want to go ahead and update that thing. It's, it's so funny how it mimics and apes legitimate applications and software Yeah. because that's what you do if you want software to be good and effective. They just want it to be good for bad reasons, <laughs> which is weird. Yeah, say, right? motivation's not really in the right place there, I yeah, guess, for yeah, having yeah. the software be, be high quality. Now, once this is fully uh, executed, once this is fully, you know, you've clicked the link, you've gone about your business, and it's done what it needs to do. Yeah. What's then the end result? Is it just then, okay, well, you know, if it's on my computer, yeah. they can use my computer like a, in a botnet. That, botnet is, cr that is absolutely okay, it. Gotcha. So I can make you a part of my botnet. I can, uh, so remember, these are initial access processors. So as far as they're concerned, they're done, right? Mm. They've got what they needed, which is access to the device, and they have control over the device. Cool. Now they sell that to whatever bidder, and then that person's intentions, whether it be botnet, whether it be, so maybe they want to do a, a distributed denial of service. Now your machine is a part of that distributed denial of service botnet. Maybe you have, you know, you're part of an organization that they're targeting. Now they have access to said organization because you have access to said organization. So it's all going to depend on who eventually purchases the access from the IAB right. and what they want. So their their motives are going to be their own. Hmm. Okay. But and that various is... and sundry. <laughs> various and sundry. A cornucopia, yes. a veritable it's, it's, cornucopia of reasons. I thought it was funny they uh, they give us a little pie chart because I do love the images that they give us. I um, wish I could too. For... Here, here, we can <laughs> share. Oh, there we can share is. screens. As the, the... There he is. <laughs> uh, there's a, it's got a little chart. Uh, offering a high-level view of when new infrastructure is typically established, uh, decrease in activity noted to occur on weekends. I wonder if that's because people don't check their email on weekends, and it's just like mm, you're, only gonna, you're only going to have people really clicking on these links and then new new connections being established Monday through Friday with a weird de increase on Friday. So I guess people check yeah. their emails on Fridays before they leave the office. I don't know. But uh, I, I know think I do. Was, <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely, all day Friday. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm in there till 5.00. Checking, just checking just your emails. Just checking emails. Just watching checking teams. And teams. Checking yeah. emails. <laughs> Diligent. I know you're not watching so. teams. <laughs> I'm sending him like a link to something. And he's Damn like, teams doesn't ever work. That's true. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I'll be sitting next to him and send him a link to something, and it, it, does, it literally it doesn't never show appears. up. Yeah. It never appears. It gets lost in the ether. I'm like, why are you are you sitting right here? Just tell me. I can't verbalize a web page to you. Yeah. Let me describe it to you in detail. They've also I got would prefer that, though. <laughs> so in the top left-hand corner, there's a proof point logo. Picture, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> Join me on a journey like ChatGPT. Start talking like ChatGPT. Uh, there's also another uh, diagram here, a uh, chart, visual, yeah. if you will, that shows the latrodectus. Also, I've been pronouncing it lactrodectus. There's no C in Man, there. Man, who cares? It's latrodectus. <laughs> uh, that shows like the infrastructure and how this works. So we've got a couple servers at the top, jump boxes, which is a fun word, and then all the way down here. So it shows you kind of what the layout is like. And there's, there's a lot going on here. It's kind of their infrastructure happening mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. So obviously you've got a development server. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I didn't see what they were uh, referring to with the T2 server. Oh, yeah, good um, point. I see the BackNX C2s, which is, which is nice, and the management infrastructure. A jump box is basically a, instead of connecting directly to one of these servers, just like you would do in a real-life LAN, you do not necessarily want to correct, connect directly to your administrative servers. Mm -hmm. You want to use, because your laptop might be infected with something. So you use a remote connection into a jump box, which you then connect to. So if I want to do an RDP section, uh, se RDP session into a Windows server, I wouldn't do it from my laptop. I would log into the jump box, and from there I would do the RDP connection. Gotcha. And I would do all my connect, uh, remote control from there, or maybe SSH or whatever. It's just another layer of security that we like to use um, for that. And they're obviously they're implying that it's there as well into their infrastructure. Oh, huh, okay. That's, that's a that's a new thing for me. I'd never heard Jumpbox before today. Yeah. I noticed you've got uh, you've got a list of decoded project IDs that look like they're all named after cars. What's that yeah, all about? Well, some of them are. Uh, it's really interesting. So the the project IDs I think were the um, access that they had gotten into, and they are, or no, th this came from from um, where was it here? Uh, another campaign, right? The data represented in this update was collected between 2022 and 2023. The patterns and hypothesis formed are limited to the malware configuration data collected from approximately 100 campaigns originating from emails during the scope of time and the subset of campaign IDs successfully decrypted. While Proofpoint is planning to publish more thorough analysis 
of the patterns and campaign IDs in relation to tracked threat actors. Below is a table of selected project IDs initially brute forced. And we see Ascari. We see Austin Buick. I think these were the name of some of these campaigns. Porsche, Pontiac. And this is associated with the Iced ID campaign. Okay. And now has is is morphing and evolving into lacrosse dominoca Like a coconut. Uh, yes. Lime into coconut. Yes. That's the lime that's the lime into coconut <laughs> malware, as it were. If you click on that link, yeah. it'll mix you all up. So don't so don't <laughs> do that. <laughs> so so coming down to the bottom of this article, they do always give us a conclusion, which is nice because sometimes it's a lot of detail. There's a lot of it breaks it down. But it does say that uh, Proofpoint, at least, anticipates that it's going to be increasingly used by threat actors, uh, which doesn't surprise me because, it, I mean, it is a, it's a smart way to go about it using that, you know, hey, you've got a copyright infringement. you got to yeah. like, make sure you're not breaking the law. And then all of this stuff happening in the background. So if you do receive an email that says you're infringing on somebody's copyright and they want you to cease and desist, don't ignore it, I guess. because no, I mean, I'd but, ignore it. But, you gotta, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's also checking, like, the sender, right? Because odds are... Maybe this yep. is, it didn't mention anything about the email about typo squatting or anything. But probably, if you looked at it close enough, yeah. you'd be able to tell without even opening the email that this is not legit. Honestly, if they if they put in a name of a, a company or an organization or whatever that is claiming that they are claiming to be in the email, which most of them do, just go to that. Do not click the link that takes you there. Go open browser tab. I mean, this is not this is not difficult, <laughs> right? You go browser tab. You know, so and so law firm. I mean, kind of, there's a number right there. I mean. Um, Hi, is, are you Sally with so-and-so law firm? Yeah, I received an email. Not from you, you say. Interesting. Good to know. Have a great day. Yeah. Delete. And then, yeah, destroy your computer. Uh, yes. <laughs> a little kerosene here. I know in theory yeah. it's not hard, but it's you get an email like that, and I, I get scared. I start crying. Right. You know? like, oh, I don't want to break the law, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good person. I'm a law-abiding citizen. So mm. I would see something like that, and it might freak me out a little bit. Okay. I All wrote. Right. I wrote down here with her. When have I ever That's broken the... Uh, well, actually, yeah. Hang on. <laughs> See? <laughs> and the truth Hang comes on. out. Hang on. <laughs> it's a long drive, all right? And I'm doing right. my best to keep to stay. I was, I was a little bit sleepy. I was a little sleepy, I'll admit, on the yeah. drive. But Sorry. he talked and he kept me awake, so I that's did. good. I did. I've never knowingly broken the law. All Don't right? forget those IOCs, though. Yes, the indicators of compromise. That's a long list of them, too. It's a it's a hefty list. It is a pretty big, and, and all these long, complicated links, it's great. It's great. But it is good to know to have this available so right. that, hey, you can go in and look at that and, and cross-reference. And do you know see. what you do with these now? You use them to indicate if you have been compromised. Yeah, you, you do. <laughs> you do. But a great way to do it is to take this information, take those IOCs, and start building like Yara rules and Sigma rules, which are uh, helpful in going, if there's any of this information in a file that is on your device, you can use tools like Yara and Sigma. You create the rule that looks for these IOCs and then flags on them if it sees them. Okay. Right? Because remember, your AV and EDR might not detect it, mm -hmm. but you can create Yara and Sigma rules that go, well, hey, it's got that information in it, and I know oh. because you've made a rule that, that says that's malicious, personally, that you can start detecting for these things. Okay. So that's why you take IOCs. And I can I can look at domain names, and I can look at IP addresses that are baked in, and I can say, hey, block that using my, my um, uh, firewalls. Right. And and do DNS sync holding and all that other stuff. Okay. You see, I, I don't think Yara and Sigma rules, I don't think I was super familiar with those. You said Sigma rules, and I feel like we should start mewing. Like the... <laughs> Our poor audio listeners have no <laughs> idea what's going on. If you want to see Daniel mogging here, yeah, you gotta go. You gotta go watch the video feed. I know Christian enjoyed that. I yeah, know he did. I can see that. the smile on his face. <laughs> he's right over there, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> he's he's so embarrassed for me. It's great. It's great. Well, this is definitely a. I mean, when we say deep dive, yeah. this one went deep. It um, did. It goes super deep. Like, there's no way we could have every little detail on this right. thing. Yeah. It's a very well uh, published uh, analysis of this. Right. Of this malware. Absolutely. If you do want to get more into the details and look at those images that poor Daniel couldn't have pulled up on his screen. I was like, they where are all images. the images? He lost his image privileges. <laughs> every he... now and then security kind of bites you in the tail, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. every now and then. Uh, you get a little bit lonely because yeah. there's no pictures around. Yeah. But if you do want to take a look at those, we'll have, again, the links in our uh, description for the YouTube video. So this will be the last one on the list because it is our deep dive. I think that's, that's pretty much going to do it for the deep dive today. I do want to remind you all that ACI Learning is the, the sponsor of Technado, the folks behind IT Pro. You can use the code Technado30 for a discount. Forgot to mention it, so I wanted to make sure I tell you 
because I like you guys, and I want you to get that discount. That's right. We're, uh, we're, we're currently working on a bunch of different courses. We were recording like crazy last week. Um, so if you want to check out some of those courses in the ACI Learning IT Pro Library, Daniel and I are there, and we're having a great time doing all sorts of security stuff. Mm-hmm. You thought this was fun. Yeah. Oh, just you wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, I'll show you fun. We talked about cryptography. We did. We did some cryptography. We, we did. We did. Right? You demonstrated. I did. It was pretty cool. So if you Next week, we're going to do attacks against oh, cryptography. Actually? Yeah, we're going to play around with a little bit. I love when we get to talk about, like, the threats and attacks. Yeah. That's the fun part. But anyway, so if you want to check those out, feel free to head over to ACI Learning. If you're watching from the Technado website, you can just click the orange button, and that'll take you there. And you can use the code Technado30 if you're not already subscribed and get a discount on your membership. Speaking of subscribed, don't forget to subscribe here. We've That's got right. new Technados every Thursday. It's and simple. You just click the button. Simple, little, play button, different. Yeah. New print. <laughs> anyway. And we'll also be live streaming <laughs> subscription. Yeah, we'll be live streaming on Friday as well. Uh, it's going to be, I think, the stage that way behind us. Is that where we're going to be, or are we going to be here? Do you know? That back way. Back there. That way. Back that, that way. way. We'll be there on that stage, uh, doing some talks, some interviews, that kind of stuff. No, that's where so. the talkers will be, and then we'll bring them here. Oh, so we get to bring them up here. We get to bring oh, them. It's going to be like college game day. This is going to be great. Yes. You could tell I know a lot of information. So uh, if you want to check out those talks or the interviews, you can tune into that live stream. It's going to be on the YouTube channel right here. Am I right? As far as I know. Okay. Well, I think that's pretty much going to do it for this Technado. We've jabbered long enough. So thank you, Daniel, for deep diving with us on that. This episode Lime in the slaps. coconut dextrous. Mm. <laughs> and you know we had it's it. fire. And there it is. We, <laughs> these people. We, we lost it. <laughs> thank you for joining us and putting up with us for this week's Technado. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed today's show, consider subscribing so you'll never miss a new episode.